morning, Grace. Good morning. I hope you guys are good. You look good. Happy Father's Day to our dads out there. So I get to greet you this morning. Troy's home for the weekend. So uh, welcome, welcome. Why don't you guys stand up as we begin because, uh, you know, Father's Day is great. And dads, you are loved and desperately needed, desperately needed. And so, um, but we have, a, we have a good father who's in heaven who takes care of us. And, and the reality is, a dad, I've failed many times, as you have. As a mom, you've failed many times, but our God has never failed us, right? So we, we praise God for that. We praise God for that. So um, you might notice a, a different young lady up here. So... Um, if you have no idea why they're clapping, that's because Linda uh, was in our church for many, many, many years and decided to move to Florida last year. And so we brought her back because we needed her today, just today. So she's going to sing with us, of course, because that's what Linda does, right? She just blesses. So we're going to get to worship God. So uh, Psalm 73 says this, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. This morning, we come as one. To, to make God our refuge, to press in because the nearness of God is our good, right? So God doesn't need us to sing to him, understand that. He's, he's secure in his glory, but we need to sing to him. We need to draw unto God. So that's what we get to do this morning uh, in full openness, praise the Lord, right? So that's what we do. So why don't you pray with me as we start? Lord, I love you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we have life because the Father has loved us. We have life because you have done everything necessary that we might be in relationship with you. We bring nothing to the table, Lord. But we do come to the table because you've invited us there. And so, Lord, we, we press in this morning. I pray, Lord, that, that we would be worshipers in this place, that we would be a people who, who bow our hearts and our lives, not, not just a religious act this morning, Lord, but worship, where we glorify your name, where we worship your name, where we honor you as God and God alone. Father, be in all that happens this morning to your glory. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Worship the King today with us.
Day we get the best weather. Uh, just, just, uh, just put that out there.
You. 
so worthy to be praised. You give life. God, you are so good. Lord, we do, as we start it, who, whom in heaven have we but you? And who on earth do we desire nothing but you, Father God? We love you, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, we, we lift you up, we give you glory, honor, and praise, Father. This morning and every morning, because you are the only one who deserves it. You are the only one who deserves praise in any way. Lord, so may it be all to your glory. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Again, good morning. Good morning. It is so, so, so good to see you uh, here in this place, in this open. It's good to see you. We've had chairs like this, you know, uh, in the past year, but not every row filled with people, so that's cool, right? Uh, Praise God for that. Praise God. Praise God. Just praise God, right? Just praise God <laughs> for all of that. So we're glad you're here. So I, I want to draw your attention to um, the seat back in front of you. So there's a welcome card. So if you have never filled this out or if you're not sure if you filled this out or if there's information that we need, I need you to take it out. I I'll wait for you. Anyway, I you know, just take it out. Fill it out. Please give us your information. Please let us know. There's things we got to communicate. You know, this week I communicated with the church. Uh, that was, you know, important information. And then we still got calls, people asking us stuff because you got to read your emails. I can't help that, right? But um, please fill this out. Give us your information. Uh, we actually do a lot of, uh, not a lot actually, sometimes we blast out text. So it's, in, you know, that's just where we are in our society. So give us your cell phone number. 
give us your information, give us your stuff um, uh, for all of that. So, um, got a bee flying around here, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, hey, hello. Where are I? Did I get him? I got him. I hit him. Drat. I hit him. Oh, I'm killing him. I already killed one this morning. I don't know how they get in our building. They just love Jesus, I guess, and they want more of them. I don't know. And for those of you who are allergic, it's a test of faith. I want to see if you trust Jesus today. <laughs> so anyway, please fill that out. Please, please, please let us know. So while we're upstairs, we have two ministries downstairs, and our kids have had to be upstairs, but now, I mean, downstairs, and now they're upstairs. So uh, Super Church and Kingdom Kids, Kingdom Kids is for birth through pre-K and then uh, kindergarten through first grade. So they get to go downstairs. They're loving it. They're loving it. So having a good time, having a good time. So, um, keep praying for them. Like I said, Troy is home this weekend. Keep, you know, it's a good time. I, I don't think he's watching, so, because he's home and, and actually maybe in church, like, you know, in person, right? What the, what is that? So, um, great time, though, to, to just say, you know, God has given us a really good one in our youth and young adult pastor. Really, really good one. And, uh, but, but he needs prayer, just like I need prayer, just like you need prayer. We need to keep praying for him. Uh, he's in the midst of the fire. He sees things that, that you guys, you know, lament about in some areas. He sees them in youth group. He sees lots of stuff, and our youth team sees that too. So keep them in prayer. Plus, guess what? He's got life that, that happens, right? And so uh, just keep him before God, if you would, please. Uh, again, he's given us a good one. We're praying that Troy stays here forever, literally. Right, until he retires, and so uh, we'll see what God does with that. But, but we, we want to continue to pray and support him and do all that. So please do that. Like I said, great time to mention that. So uh, it is Father's Day. Again, like I said in the beginning of service, fathers, we love you. Uh, you are vitally important. And so we're going to celebrate you today. Uh, every Father's Day we have a, 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 a sweet time, I'll say, on the lawn. So right over to the side where the tents are set up. All kinds of goodies, bagels, goodies, hopefully, you know, all kinds of stuff. I know there's sugary stuff there, um, so it, it's good, right? So, so after the service, go right out there and just enjoy and fellowship and be with each other and enjoy each other. I will remind you, though, okay, we're fully open now, but that doesn't mean that everybody is super comfortable, Right, so we have red wristbands. I meant to bring one up in the back. And if they're wearing a red wristband, please don't just go up and hug them. You say, "Well, I've known them for thirty years. I don't care." You know, you know. Listen, just you know, say hello. And if they invite, you know, they get to they get to set the parameters, right? If they invite you in, then you go in. And if they invite somebody in, that doesn't mean they invite you in too, like everybody, right? So, so just red wristbands. And even just if you haven't seen them in a while, you ask them. We're just going to be respectful of people. I know, I know we love to hug things and everybody and all that kind of stuff, and we'll keep hugging. And we'll get back to a day when I can just warn people you're going to hug by a million people, and that'll be how it is. All right. So uh, right after the service, there's that. Uh, believer's baptism. So we practice believer's baptism here, which means that those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are baptized. So if you've never been baptized since you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, we would invite you to join into that. So there's a sign-up in the back. Uh, August 1st, we're having a, a church picnic at the Rudolosos like we've done the last several years. And they have a great pool, and we'll be baptizing there. And so if you've never been baptized, or even if you have questions and wonder about it, you can put your name on the sheet there, and we'll, we'll talk, and we'll answer all those questions, and we'll just have a great time as we celebrate what God has done in us, right? All right, so there's that. Um, ladies, so our, our Bible studies, our home groups, our, our life groups usually take a break in the summer. And so this summer, ladies, you are going to be gathering together while the life groups are breaking. And you're going to be enjoying a study on Wednesday evenings. That starts July 31st. It's only like a five-week study. And uh, really easy, right? Really easy, ladies. You can do this. So join it. I think it will be right here. Um, so there is a sign-up on the back table, though. We'd love for you to sign up for that. So all ladies are, in, are invited. That, that's young ladies to older ladies, right? Everybody. 
So think about being a part of this, ladies, and enjoying that time. All right, I have one more order of business, and that is this. So, um, you know, Linda moved to uh, Florida last year, and so, you know, we've had some people move away, and, and uh, it, we're always sad, right, when they're a part of our family. And so this summer we're losing another family. Uh, today, for most of them, it's their last day, and that's the Rice family. So, um, um, you know, uh, actually, Jimmy, Jim, James, I don't know, whatever, is going to be staying for the whole summer. And, and I would normally say that means he needs an invite over to your house for dinner because Karen won't be cooking with him. But I think he's staying with Lori and Pat, right? So uh, he'll be well fed. <laughs> like, he's going to, like, you're not going to recognize him, Karen, when he comes there. He'll be like, like this, you know, whatever. So, because <laughs> if you've ever been to Lori and Pat's house, they're like, you want more? You want more? You want more? They have plenty of food, and it's so good. So, um, so I'm going to ask the rice. I know you guys don't want to do this, but we're going to ask you to come up because we want to pray for you guys. So why don't you guys come up? So um, K- this is Karen and Jaylee and Jackson's last Sunday in New York. Uh, uh, this week they close on their house, and then they um, – yeah, you're too tall. Move over. <laughs> That's right. I love it. So uh, – and then uh, this week they'll be moving to South Carolina. So – uh, right outside of Columbia, about a half hour, so you can keep them in prayer. And then, like I said, Jimmy and Jimmy will be still in the state for a little bit till the kind of the end of the summer. And then uh, again, you can you can just keep them in prayer. And as the family is separated, and Karen sets up house kind of on her own, and uh, and all of that. So um, I don't have a mic for you, but you want to say anything? I don't know. Oh, hey, I got a mic for you. You want to say something? Jimmy wants always wants to say something. Uh, I just lost your I just lost your pick and your mic was kept on. <laughs> he needs a There we go. I would say that you guys have been nothing short of family um, since we've been coming here. From the first time that I come here, I I knew that this was the place to be. I knew it was it's a long haul for us, 45 minutes uh, one way to Southampton, but you guys have been family to us ever since uh, we started coming here. And we're going to miss every, each and every one of you so much. There's so much we're going to miss about New York <coughs> and uh, this church. And I just want to thank Pastor for being uh, a rock we could rely on during lots of times, uh, hard times in our marriage and hard times in our lives. And you've been there through it all. And we just love you so much for it. Thank you for explaining the Bible to us in such a way that we could uh, understand it so well. Uh, so we're going to miss you guys. Uh, but make no mistake, where we go, we go with Jesus. And uh, God's calling us down there. But I can't wait to see the doors that open. All right, so pray for us, and we love you. Thanks. So... Um yeah, you know, so they live the furthest away in our church and might be some of the people, and not everybody, but some of the people who are here most often. And I don't mean just on Sunday morning. I mean, uh, and again, Jimmy's going to be here till the end of the summer, but these guys have been vitally important in our ministries and uh, in, in what they do. As a matter of fact, so, uh, you know, when COVID hit last year, uh, Jim didn't miss a Sunday until about two weeks ago. Right, because he's that committed to the ministry and to what we've done. Done. Karen has done a great job in uh, Kingdom Kids downstairs, and so again, we're going to miss them, but we're going to pray for them. And uh, I want to ask you to join with me in prayer, and then make sure you stay for fellowship time so that you can say hello and goodbye and and all those kind of things. And and uh, you know, and if you want to invite Jimmy over for dinner, you can do that because he probably you know well, he'll be fine anyway. <laughs> Whatever, but uh, <laughs> so can you guys pray with me for them? Father God, Lord, I, I just thank you for this family. When they walked into our building, I don't know, eight years ago, <laughs> ten years ago, wow. Um, Lord, what a blessing that we didn't even know that they would bring. And uh, Father, I just pray that you would be over them because I, 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 Lord, one of the things I know is that what they're going to miss is this church. And so, Lord, would you just provide for them in every way? 
That, that includes a church in South Carolina. That includes a family of Christ that will surround them and be with them. Lord, will you especially be with them as they um, are separated, Karen and Jim? Lord, would you be with them for this summer as Jim just finishes up projects of construction that he's had in contract with? And Lord, would you just, um, just provide in every way, um, even as you have, Lord, even as you've opened up the doors, you've opened up the doors. And so, Father, um, we don't say goodbye to them as we do. We send them. Lord, uh, they are, in a sense, missionaries from our church. Uh, they are, in a sense, because they've grown here, they've loved you here, they've served here, Father. And, and they now get to go and use what you have built in them to further your kingdom in, in another place. And so... Just be with them, Lord. Be with Jim, be with Karen, be with Jimmy, be with Jaylee and Jackson, Lord. In every way, may you bless this. May they uh, in every way know that you are guiding their steps and you are leading the path and you are opening the doors. And may they see that. May they see that, Lord, and how you provide for them in South Carolina. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for your grace and mercy and for what you give us. We thank you for family in Christ and togetherness in Christ. Lord, may you be glorified. I love you, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Whew, all right. You know, um, I, I tell people that leave, that, that go someplace else, and they, and they go and, and we miss them, that that's how it's supposed to be, right? I mean, I, I, I'm... I, well, if they would have asked me, can they go, I would have said no. Uh, they didn't. They asked God, you know, whatever, okay. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Keep it before the Lord, right? And like I said, we send them, um, but we're going to miss them, and that's a good thing. That's the way church should be. Church should be like, this is my family, and, and I'm going to miss them. And uh, we've had, a, you know, the people that have moved, I mean, a lot of people, we've had, a, I mean, in my 12 years here, we've had a lot of people move, um, you know, and the most often phrase I hear is the thing I will miss most is this church in New York. That's cool, right? So keep loving, you know, keep, keep doing that together. All right, we're good there. All right, we got to get to Galatians, all right? This is our last week, our last week in the book of Galatians. Uh, we have been studying this uh, since the beginning of... Um, Beginning of like February, middle of February, and so we get to, to do that. And I don't know about you, but this has been a powerful, I mean a powerful book for me, and I think a book that our church needed to walk through, you know, um, you know, and, and I got to tell you, I, I, like I said, as your lead pastor, I, I needed to spend time in here, and I think our church did. Why? Well, because we live in a confusing world. And, and it's only getting more confusing. Can we admit that, right? I mean, there are just, just crazy things happening out there. People jumping into all kinds of things. And, and, and even in our church, even in this good church, sometimes we can forget what the main point is. Sometimes we can forget, you know, you know that old saying, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Right? Sometimes we, we can forget that. And, and, and in pursuit of happiness, in pursuit of fulfillment, sometimes that leads us away from God. Uh, I'm going to jump to this verse. So John 10.10 John 10 says this. John 10.10, 10, Jesus is speaking, and it says, um, yeah, you need to hit the background thing. There you go. John 10.10 10 says this. The, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, but I came that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly, that you may have a fullness of life, a fullness of life. And, and so what he's saying, what I would tell you is that the fullness of life, the fullness of life that God wants you to have only happens in relationship with Jesus Christ. Only happens in relationship with Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that, that you can't have a good marriage or that you can't raise moral kids, all right? Matter of fact, you, you can. I know people who don't know Jesus. They have great, great marriages and, and have some pretty good kids, all right? But they're not going to have the fullness of life because they don't get 
the fullness of all that God wants us to have. And so, and, and so that happens in Jesus Christ. And, and here's the reality of, of, of I think, of, of our lives. We are driven. We are driven by what we think will bring us fullness of life. We're driven by that. So, so often that means, oh, well, I know God says this, but, you know, this is what's going to make me happier. This is what's going to make me fuller. This is what's going to make me complete. And so we, we lust after things. We search after things because we, we think that they're going to be good for us. They, we think that they're going to they're gonna meet our needs, that they're going to bring us fullness, that they're going to bring us what we want in life. And so we, we chase after that. But again, we forget that fullness of Christ only comes in Jesus and it comes in that relationship with him. And Paul has been fighting this idea because we haven't talked about this yet in this way. But he has been fighting against this idea that, that we can somehow get Jesus outside of Christ or maybe a little bit of Christ, but like mostly us. Right? And so he's been fighting against two things that, that, that bring us maybe, uh, 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 that we think will bring us fullness as it comes to relationship with Christ. You know, and I'm talking about in, in the church. And that is legalism and license. Legalism says that I can earn God's favor. Legalism says that I just have to, you know, do the check mark. I'm in church this Sunday. I've punched my card. Right, so God's happy with me. I've done all the religious things I need to do. You know, I've given a tithe. I've been nice to somebody today. You know, you know, pay it forward. You know, I bought their, I bought their coffee at Starbucks. Look at me, woohoo! You know, and we think if I can just do the checklist, if I can just be good enough, if I can just do these things that God might require of me, then, then God will like me. Ultimately, what it says is that I can manipulate God's affections for me based on, our, on my performance. That, that I can manipulate whether God loves me or not based on, based on what I do. And so if I just do this, he'll like me more. He'll, he'll like me more. And so we, we get into this, to this place, like I said, where, where we're seeking for God's affections by just doing this. And often, like I said, it's usually the minimum. What, what's the minimum that I have to do? How many, how many times do you have to be in church a year for God to really be okay with you? I mean, some of us work, work off that model. Maybe even some people in this church, right? Some people are here today, and I've said this to you. Some people are here today because you're trying to make God happy with you because you messed up this week. And so kind of in repentance or in some sort of thing, you know, you're trying to give a sacrifice by coming to church. And you think that that's going to appease the holy God uh, for you. Again, that's legalism. Which says that really God's affections are based on my affections for me or based on whether I'm good this week or not. And then license is the other one. License says, really says that I know what's best for me. That I can do whatever I want. That I can do whatever I want because I know what's best for me. I know what's going to bring happiness. I know what's going to bring fulfillment. And so I can do anything I want to do and, and God will forgive me. As a matter of fact, he's obligated to forgive me in his love. In Jesus. I, I've heard people talk like that. I've heard people say, well, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but God will forgive me, right? We, we don't, I mean, we just step all over the grace of God that way. So we get this, this idea that, that somehow, again, in license, that, that I'm God and that I'm the one who needs to be pleased, that really the world circulates around me and my desires and my, the, the things that I want. And, and Paul has dismantled. I, I mean, I don't know how other way, what other way to say it. He has just dismantled every argument against against. Uh, legalism and license against every argument that would say that, that I'm the center of the universe, that I'm the one who needs to add to what Jesus Christ has done to, to be saved. And so he is just, like I said, he has attacked this with, with ferociousness and, and, um, and has not left any in. So we're going to get to this. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to Galatians chapter 6. 
Galatians chapter 6. We're going to do the last few verses of this book, and then we're going to move on. And I told you, where I'm going to next is Nehemiah. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a week or two to kind of bridge that gap, if you will, between uh, Nehemiah is a very different book with a very different purpose than Galatians is. And so we're going to bridge that gap, if we can say it that way. Um, but get on it. Go, go read Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a, an amazing book, an amazing book. So um, that will just teach us a lot of stuff. So. Galatians chapter 6, though, what we're going to do is we're going to do just what we've done through the book of Galatians and what I do every week. Even if, even if I'm not in a book, you know, like I won't, you know, we won't be next week, you know, we're just going to take that. We're going we're gonna to allow the passage to drive what is happening here. So look at what he says. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, Paul says this, see with what large letters I am writing you with my own hand. So most, most commentators that agree, you know, he's probably got a scribe, but at this point he takes the pen, and he, and he begins to write for himself, and he writes with large letters. And what does that mean? Well, basically, he started this book with a lot of passion, right? He started this book saying, I cannot believe that you people would so quickly leave the gospel that set you free for something that's not a gospel. And he was passionate and, and on fire, and he has not lost that at all. And so he says at the end, look with what large letters. So it would be like you writing in all caps, you know, so we text today, right? And, and even on, you know, on email, I can bold and italicize and underline and make it red, blue, yellow, green, right, to make sure you look at that word because I have something to emphasize. You can't do that on text, so you got to capitalize everything. Right? So you're like, I want to emphasize. He's saying, listen, look at what, look at what large letters I am writing in this because, because as I close out this book, you need to hear this. Like I said, he has dismantled any argument that, that you can somehow add to the gospel in order to be found acceptable before God. Why would he have to do that? Well, because for the Galatians, the Judaizers had come in. These are men that were Hebrews that had come in from probably from Jerusalem area, and they, had, they, they would agree, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, you got to believe in Jesus, but, but you really got to be Jewish. Like, you got to have certain things done. You got to be circumcised. Like, circumcision is the big one. Right? We'll talk about it in a little bit, you know, but you've got to follow the law. You've got you've to you know, you know, follow the dietary laws. You've got to be Jewish to be saved. God's had this whole system of law that he has, that has set up that, that Judaism has been following for a thousand years at this point. And now you're just going to dump it for freedom in Jesus? And they couldn't comprehend that. Again, we'll, we'll talk about that. And so, so these Judaizers have come in. And so, so he has challenged them. Like I said, he has dismantled these arguments about like, all right, well, maybe I can be both end and all that. But he has one more thing to say to them and one more, one more challenge for the Galatians, who, by the way, aren't Jewish. This is a Gentile church. It's not a Jewish church that he's saying, get back to your roots. This is a Gentile church, and they can't comprehend how somebody who's not Jewish or at least following the Jewish law could be allowed into the kingdom of God. And yet, if you just read your Old Testament, that was God's plan all along, right? So... So he challenges them. Look what it says in verse 12. He says, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So he's made allusion to this earlier on, but now he kind of hits it head on. Paul says that the Judaizers wanted to get the Galatians into the kingdom so that there would be some sort of kind of benefit for them with the Jews and so that there wouldn't be persecution in that any longer. So because when they, when they left Judaism, or, or at least when they began following Christ and they began following the law of Christ, and we'll talk about some of that, they stopped practicing they stopped practicing. Why? Because they're sacrif they don't have to go do sacrifices anymore. The ultimate sacrifice has come. Right? They don't have to follow the dietary laws. He was clear with Peter. All things are now clean before God. 
And what happened with that is they were immediately removed from the temple. You, I mean, you remember, even Paul started out persecuting the church. He, started, he, he was willing for men to die and stood in opposition to those, stood in authority as one even when Stephen was stoned. And he was rounding up Christians, those who were Jews, who had left, if you can say it that way, didn't really leave Judaism, just enjoyed the fulfillment of it. And, we're, and was rounding them up until Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and says, what are you doing, Paul? And then Paul's eyes are open, literally, because God blinds him. But it's open to the God, and, and actually all of the word of God, because the only word of God Paul had was the Old Testament at that point. And his eyes are open, and he begins seeing Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. And that God's plan was always the Messiah, and always the Christ, and always the always the freedom in Jesus Christ that we have. And so, and so this persecution that was there, and so, listen, I'm not there. You know, I wasn't there 2,000 years ago and feel that pressure. But, but these men, these Judaizers, he says, are only there so that, so that they can kind of take away that offense, that they can take away the, the offense of the cross, and they can be acceptable before men. They can be acceptable before, before men so that they won't be persecuted in what they do. They won't be persecuted for the cross of Jesus Christ. And it, it's amazing, right? So um, the, the cross of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block. Peter says all throughout the scripture, right, we know it's a stumbling block. Well, why would, why would the cross of Jesus Christ be a stumbling block? For a Jew, why would, why, would, why would a Jew think that the cross is a stumbling block? you, you got to wonder that, right? Well, the cross is a stumbling block because they could not comprehend how God would allow, that God would take on flesh and that he would become a curse for us. That God would, would be hung. God would never do that. God would never lower himself. To our depths and to, to be willing to sacrifice for that. He's God. He's too holy. He's too righteous. Right? And, and, and again, that's why it's all about them. They just have to do more for God. They just have to honor him. And yet, the reality of it is, is that God indeed come to our level. Thank you, Lord. He did come down to us and was willing to become a curse. Paul's already dealt with this. If you look back just a page. Galatians chapter 3. All right. Two pages. Sorry, I lied. Right, verse 13, Paul says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Think about that. And, and, and when, I, when I think about it, and you should, you should take time and meditate on the word of God and what Jesus Christ has done for you. Because when, when, it, it just blows my mind when I stop and I think of the fact that God came down, took on flesh, and he, and he took upon himself my sin. He took upon himself my sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, right, says that he made him who knew no sin to become sin on my behalf so that I might become the righteousness of God. He, he took sin upon himself for me. He became a curse so that the curse that I am under would no longer be there. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's what, and, 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 and Jews, listen, even if you were to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and, and if you just looked at his life and the miracles that he performed, and the fact of what he could do and the authority that he had, there's, there's no way, uh, you know, it, it's just intellectually dishonest to look at Jesus if this happened and to say, well, he was just a regular guy. I was just talking with somebody this, this week on mission about the fact of, you know, you, you, gotta, you, 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 can't, you can't look at Jesus and just think that Jesus is just this really great teacher, really moral guy, really great guy. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. He made himself equal with the Father. They understood what they meant, that meant. Jesus, well, he was misunderstood. No, he wasn't. And you can't look at Jesus and go, well, he's a great guy. I mean, you know, he thinks he's somebody, but he's really not. So either he's lying about that. I love, 
I love the argument. I don't know if it was from C.S. Lewis or before that, right? Liar, lunatic, or Lord. That's what we, I, I got a chance to share that, right? So if Jesus knew he wasn't God and the Messiah and the only way, but said he was, then he's a liar. And, and in no way should be followed by anybody. I don't care that he was nice to people. If, if Jesus thought he was God, but he really wasn't, man, that makes, that's nuts, right? You're a lunatic. You're crazy. And why would you follow a crazy person? But if he knew who he was, if he knew, you know, if he thought that he was the Lord and God and the only way to heaven and all that, and he really is that, then he is the Lord of the universe. And, and again, the argument goes that there, there's only three choices. What are you going to do with Jesus? What you can't do with Jesus is just go, well, yeah, but he just was a really great guy and, and he was misunderstood. I had somebody once say to me, you know, when they said, well, you know, there's other ways to heaven and other religions have their way to heaven. And I said, well, I don't, I'm just a simple guy, all right? I mean, it, listen, if, if you're new here, um, you know, I, I'm just, I, I just, I just believe Scripture. You know, I just try to open up the word, try to explain what he's trying to say to us. I do try to apply it. Listen, but we're just simple here. And, and so I said to that person, this was a long time ago. I was a very young Christian at the time. And I said, but I knew John 14, 6. I said, but, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. And they said, well, that's, that's, just, that's just your interpretation of it. I was like, how do you interpret any of different? I mean, how do you interpret that differently? But see, that's what we want to do. See, because we want to think that we know best and we, we, we can figure out our way. And so these guys are just all about them, and they're all about what they'll get, and they're all about the fact that they, they didn't want to be persecuted for the cross of Christ because the cross is a stumbling block. And it's always a stumbling block to anybody out there because we want to think that I have to have some participation in it, and you get none. You get none. You, you cannot do enough to make it okay before God. And so that's what we do. We take the emphasis off the work of Christ and we put it on man and then we're back to the races. And then we're back to this extremely exhausting life where we have to try to do enough good to make God happy. That is exhausting to live that way. Or we just have to check out and just hope that we'll be okay. Which is really what a lot of people do today. You know, we just, we just kind of check out. All right, so look at what he's saying. Back to what he's saying. He says, for those, verse 13, who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. So he brings up this idea of circumcision, right? So I'm not going to explain what circumcision is physically. Hopefully you know. If you don't, you can come tell me. I have no problem telling you. I'm just not going to tell you here, all right? But what we need to understand is what it, what it meant symbolically in, in, in Israel. Right? So God had marked his people, literally, physically, as his people through circumcision. That, that they were his people. It was kind of their, their way to say, yes, I'm in fully. Yes, I'm in. I'm, I'm here, right? So, so this is how God marked his people. And so there was this idea that, that you did. But very quickly, very quickly, as most things do, it, it stopped being about about really a relationship with God, and it started becoming about just, well, just get baptized and you're, I mean, I mean you just get circumcised and you're fine. And I say baptism because that's really kind of the, the alternate today, right? We don't, we don't really believe that circumcision is kind of that mark of God, but baptism is for a lot of people. Well, just be baptized and you'll be all right. Just be baptized and everything will be fine. And, and that's not, that's not Scripture, Right, so, so he says, this and this, he says, those people who want you to be circumcised, because these are Gentiles, these are uncircumcised believers, right, those who want you to be circumcised, they don't even follow the law themselves. And what he's saying there is he's going back to what he's talked about earlier in the book of the fact that, listen, there are only two systems. There's only two ways to heaven, right, and you get, you, you, you pick your system. So it's either law, but you either have to follow the whole law or you're going to be judged by that law. So I do like to say to people, there are two ways to heaven, right? If you're perfect and never commit a sin, you're good. 
Anybody, anybody here? I'm not even going to raise my hand like I can ask anybody, right? We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? So if you're going to, if you're going to kind of jump into the, to that bucket where, well, I've got to do this and I've got to make sure that I have this done to me or that done to me or I've got to make sure I go to church. I don't know. What is it? You know, for some people, the minimum is two, Christmas and Easter. You know, for some, it's two times a month, right? I told you a few weeks ago. In Christianity today, we, we, in, 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 in surveys today, we, the way we measure regular attendance in church is if you come twice a month. I'm just here to tell you, I don't think that's regular attendance. Now listen, I'm not saying don't go away. Go away. Go on vacation. Go do stuff. Stuff happens. I get that. Right? You're sick. If you're sick, please stay home. COVID or not. Really, COVID or not, if you're, if you're like coughing all over the place, just stay home. Right? We do have online. We don't have online so that because you're tired, you can stay home today. Right? We have online because if you can't make it and or if you know somebody that you can invite that maybe they check us out in video before they come because this is the church. It's the church gathered. Right? So, <laughs> so you're either going to jump into that bucket and you've got to follow the whole law or you're going to be judged by that law. Or you're going to jump into the bucket, if we can say it that way, into the bucket of grace. The bucket that says, I, I got nothing to bring. I, I got nothing to bring God. What do, what do I have to bring God that he's going to be somehow happy with me enough to accept me? Enough to say, oh, you're good. You're good. Man, you, you've, you've done so much. You've tried so hard. You've done all those things so well. Because the reality is the law is not just about this outward thing. And I've said, he's only given us ten commandments and we can't even follow those. Because it's not just about outward, it's about inward also. I mean, I, I could say, I've never had an adulterous affair. Check. Um, that might be about it. <laughs> you know, um, you know, because you know, I want to say, well, I don't, I don't lie, and I, and you've heard me say that. You know, the thing that bugs me, I, I get bugged by lying. I mean, I just, that is like the thing that. That is just, in my household, I, I don't expect anybody to lie. But have I lied? Sure. Sure. I, I like what, what, what uh, Kirk Cameron talks about, right? He says, what do, you, what do you call people who lie? Liars, right? So you're a liar. No, I'm not. Well, that just sounds so bad. No, you're a liar. We all are. We all have. And, and unfortunately, probably still will. Right? Maybe it won't be big lies. Maybe it'll be little lies. Right? Maybe I won't have an adulterous affair, but maybe I'll look at a woman lustfully. Maybe we won't, you know, sir, coveting. Holy crow, man. Coveting on the island here? Does anybody covet anything? <laughs> Listen, I, I see people's grass and I covet. Man, I want that lawn. Oh, I can't. I have that lawn. You know? <laughs> The things we covet. I don't covet cars. I cover lawns. Covet lawns, you know, whatever. Right? So, right, there's, it's in us. We can't even follow that. We can't even follow that. So either you're going to jump in this bucket where you think that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try really hard and base it on the law, and you're going to fail, and your failure is separation from God from, for an eternity. It is hell. Or you're going to give up on yourself. You're going to give up on your goodness. You're going to give up on what you can do to make yourself, to, to, to have God's affections. And you're going to fall upon the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ and his death. That, those are the only options. That's all we got. He says, even, even those who don't do it. Matter of fact, he says, listen to what he says. He says, may I never boast. Right? They desire for you to be circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh, but may I never, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Oh, that was loud. Right? So, so grace says that there's absolutely nothing I can do to be found, to be found right with God. May I, I can't boast in my flesh. May I, may, I, may I boast in nothing except for Jesus. 
except for Jesus. May, may I boast in, in none of that. You say, well, well how do I, <laughs> I mean, listen, how do, how do you boast in a flesh that fails? Well, I, I tried really hard. And you know what you're f- trying brought you? Failure. But that's what we're coming kind of around. Well, I tried really hard. God will give me points, extra credit for trying really hard. But the reality is, if we're honest about our heart, we try hard sometimes, and then we don't try very hard other times. Right? We allow the emotion of a moment to, to carry us away. I had a, one of those moments the other day, our, our dishwasher leaked because I hooked, I mean, not a dishwasher, a wash machine, because I hooked it up wrong, and I'm yelling at my boys because they're not fast enough for me for the thing that I did wrong. Because of, well, you know, I didn't want it to get into the carpet, and the, but really? Like, how, how quickly we lose things, and we lose perspective. Yeah, pray for my boys. Pray for my boys. What does me in is, is green grass and, and flowing water. I don't know. It just, it just does me in. Right? All right? So how do I boast in the flesh that fails? Right? I, I try really hard. No, look at what he says. Like I said, may it never be that I would boast in anything except the cross of Jesus. In Christ, see, what he's saying is I do have a reason to boast. But it's not about that I've been good this week. It's not about that I've done something to earn something before God. All I have to boast in is Jesus. There's nothing else I got. There's nothing else I got because I'm not, I I don't earn God's affections because I've been good this week. He loves me in spite of me. He loves me even though I'm sinful, even though I fail, even though I lose it over a washing machine every once in a while or whatever, right? Even though I lose it over something, panic, that something happens. He still loves me. Why? I have no idea. But I, I, I really praise God that he does. Right? So, so what do I have to boast in? Can, can I boast in? Am, am I going to stand up here on Father's Day? I don't, I don't preach the Hallmark calendar, as you can tell. Right? But am I going to stand up here and go, man, you, you try to be a father like me. I'm really good. You talk to my boys, they'll tell you, eh, not so much. I mean, listen, I'm all right. I, well, I hope. I, I try. I try really hard. Isn't that good enough? So what do I have to boast in? I have to boast in Christ. Matter of fact, I want you to do something. I, I, don't, I rarely do this, but this is, and this is a longer passage, but I want you to actually turn because I want you to see this. So turn back a few books. So, so you're in Galatians, so you'll go through 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and then to Romans, chapter 3. I want you to see this. I want you to see it. Romans, chapter 3. If you have a phone, it's really easy. You just hit the three little thing or whatever, you know. All right, Romans chapter 3, verse 21. That's where we're going to start. I want you to see it. Please do that. I I want you to see these words because this this talks about how we have no reason to boast. And this is why. Look at what it says. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 says this. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So what is he saying there? The righteousness is, is, not, is not manifested by the law. right? It's, being, it's manifested apart from the law, the righteousness of God. But the law gave witness to it. You can look back in the Old Testament, and, and that's what Paul did when his eyes were open. He looked back and went, wow, look, there's, there's, a, there's something pointing to Jesus. There's something pointing to Jesus. There's something pointing to Jesus. Look, God wanted the Gentiles to come in. Look at all of this. Right? Just go. The, the law testifies to it, but it didn't bring about righteousness. It was never supposed to. The law of God is never supposed to kind of make us righteous. The law of Christ is only supposed to show us that we can't do it on our own. It's a tutor. It's a, I, I, I've talked about it in this way. It wasn't my illustration. Right? I, I got it from somebody else. Most of what I say, I do. Right? So, but the illustration of it is when you're sick, you go to a doctor. You get an x-ray, an MRI, or something like that. And it's able to tell. But, but getting the MRI and seeing what's going on inside of you doesn't fix you. It's only prescriptive. It only tells you what's wrong. That's what the law does. It tells us what's wrong and that we have a need, right? So so it gives witness to that. So, So what fixes our need, all right? What's being manifested is the righteousness of God, even verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus 
for all who believe. So what brings righteousness into our lives? It's that transfer that happens at that moment of faith where you trust in the work and the cross of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. And stop trusting in your work and your goodness and your religion and your anything. You trust in Jesus Christ alone. Right? He, he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. It's the beautiful exchange that happens at that moment of salvation, at that moment of faith. So he says, right, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? None of us deserve it. None of us deserve it. We've all sinned. We've all sinned. Verse 24, he says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So, I, I, you know, some people would tell you, right, you, you write you, you, certain things to circle. You circle gift and you circle grace in your Bibles. If you want to write in there, right, you circle that. What, what does that mean? Well, that means grace, that, that gift that God gives in grace is an unmerited favor. That means that you don't deserve it. That means that even though you were good this week, you don't deserve God's love. As a matter of fact, you realize what God says in his word, in the Old Testament, by the way. He says all of those things. So, so if we're bad in a week, well, we know we don't deserve God's love, right? But if we're really good, we might think, oh, maybe I've been good enough to be loved by God. You know what God calls your righteous deeds, your, your good things? He calls them filthy rags. That doesn't mean that they are, you know, that, oh, that's not good. Then, then my good deed wasn't good. Well, it might be good, but it didn't earn anything before God. Like, God didn't go, all right, that's enough. You did it. You know, you came three times this month. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, so it, that's not what he's talking about, right? So it's, it's, this, it, it's, it's this gift, this unmerited favor that we don't deserve, and yet it's given to us. It's given to us. Well, well, how? Right? Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Then he explains this. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. I know that's a long word, theological word, hard to understand. It means God's wrath is satisfied. It means that God has taken upon himself. He's redeemed us. He's atoned for our sins. He has, he has paid for the things that we were due. He paid for them. He took the wrath that was due us and he took it upon himself. He said this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So God's being righteous in that he died for us? Well, how is that? He says this, so that uh, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. That means he did, that doesn't mean he excused them. What he means, he's had patience toward them. Just like with you, when you first sinned against God, you should be a black spot on the ground, right? We all understand. We, I mean, listen, I deserve nothing except to be a black spot on the ground with God. He's done, right? That's how I used to view God, you know, always slamming me, always ready to pound me. That was kind of my upbringing in a, in a sense where I viewed God as always waiting to, I messed up so he can bring the hammer down on me. Because he was just always a God about don't do, don't do, don't do, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. No fun in your world. How dare you? Right? And so we think God's ready to pound us, and yet that's not what he, in, for, in his forbearance, in his patience, in his grace, he doesn't pound us. Right? But, but still in his righteousness, because wait, because he can't just overlook them. That wouldn't be righteous. If God just over, well, you know what, I love you, you're really cute, I'm just going to let you go on this one. Then he wouldn't be just. He, he wouldn't be righteous in who he is. So he says, look at what he says. Demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
So he's just in what way? He's just in the fact that he did not overlook our sin. He can't. He's righteous. He can't just give us a pass. He has to punish sin. That's righteousness and justice. But not only is he just because he punishes sin in Jesus, not Jesus' sin, but ours, he's also the justifier, the one who takes our sin upon him. For who? For those who have faith in Jesus, for those who trust him as his Savior. So look at what it says, verse 27. Where then is the boasting? Where's the boasting? It's excluded. I, I, I got nothing. I got nothing that I bring to God. Paul argues, Paul's argument takes away all boasting in anything of me. Well, I try really hard, it's not good enough. Well, wait a second. I mean, I, but, I'm, but I'm really trying. I want to be better. Uh, not good enough. What do I got? I got nothing. As the old hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I cling. I got nothing before God. But this is the goodness of God, <laughs> is that he loved you in spite of that. Is that he sent Jesus in spite of the fact that, that you would die. And for so, so as I've said so often through the book of Galatians, we need to ultimately, we just need to give up on ourselves. And we need to cling to the grace and the mercy of a God who loves us and who died for us. We need to, we need to cling to that. So, he says, he says, but may it be that I would not, that may, may, sorry, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus. I, I, I can boast in him. Yeah, why do you have something? Because of Jesus. Well, what are you hoping for, Jesus? Well, but you were really good this week, Jesus. Well, you were really kind to me. Thank you, Jesus. I, I got nothing. I got nothing. It's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. He says, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know what that means? He says, when I, when I enter into Jesus, I stop becoming God. I don't have to start looking to me and looking to purpose for myself and somehow be okay with God. I'm okay with God, not based on me, but based on Jesus. And so that also means that I don't have to try to be better than somebody else. I don't have to try to, well, you know, at least I'm better than that person next door. I don't have to do that. I don't have to compare myself. I'm simply free to praise God for the blessings that he brings anybody and what he does. That's freedom. That is freedom. That is freedom. He says so, verse 15. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So what matters in life? What matters is the new life. What matters is what Christ has done in us. What matters is Jesus. What matters is the gospel. It, it harkens back to Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the, the life I live now, I live in the, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know what? I don't even hope that I'm going to stay in God because I'm good. Because I'm not. Because I still blow it. I'm in Jesus today, and I'm still your pastor, not because I've been righteous enough to be that. But because of the mercy and the grace of God. And I got, no place to, I got no place else to go. I got no place else to go. So he says in verse 16, he, all that matters is new creation. And those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Listen, what rule? The rule of faith. The rule of, of, of Jesus. The rule where I just go to God. I, I, don't, I, I give up on myself. I give up on my righteous deeds. I give up on my trying I give up on my train. And again, this is all about so that I can earn favor before God. It doesn't mean that after I fall upon his grace, then yes, I want to do good things because that's who I am. 
Because it's not about earning God's favor this week. It's about the fact that that is who I am. And when I don't live up to that, I need to repent of that sin and then say, God, but I'm yours. Let me never forget who I am. That's freedom. I don't have to carry around the burden of sin any longer. It's gone. Because of Jesus. Because of his righteousness. And so whoever walks in that role by, the, by grace through faith. <laughs> mercy and peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God. You know who the Israel of God is? Those who follow Jesus. Those who worship God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now he's not talking about that's, that's all of us that we're now the new. No, no. He's talking about Jews who will worship God through Jesus Christ. You know, and, and like I said, it's not about leaving that. It's about enjoying the fulfillment of that. I like to tell people, you know, Jesus was Jewish. You know? I mean, he didn't stop being Jewish. He did, in fact, though, walk in freedom. Verse 17, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus Christ. And I think that's just the final thing. If anybody doubts Paul's commitment to Christ, he, he bears the marks of the one who is not bowed to the things of the world. Listen, he, he could have been easy. Remember back in, in, in chapter 5, he says, if, if, I'm, if I'm preaching circumcision, why, why have I, am, I, am I still persecuted? I've, I've taken away the offense of the cross. May it never be. Is the cross offensive? Yep. Do we back down off the cross? No. Why? Because that's all I got. All I have is the cross. All I have for righteousness of God is not you trying to get better. And too often in our good church, we argue with people trying to change their behavior before they change their heart. That's why we need this book. Because their behavior will do nothing for them except give them a little peace and a little blessing on this earth. But it's not going to earn anything before God. What they need is Jesus. What they need is the cross. What they need is to come in, in, in this place where they, where, they, where they just come face to face with Jesus. Where we give up on ourselves. Where we where we stop trying to think that we know what's going to bring fullness of life, where we stop trying to think that we know what's best for us so that all will be good. And what we do is we fall upon Jesus. And that's all we got. That's all we got. Right? I, I can't do it. We're driven by what we think will bring fullness of life. Let me tell you something. Everything on this earth is a temporary pleasure. Everything on this earth will fade away. All you will have is Jesus. So fall into his arms. And, and let me invite you, as I've done a lot in Galatians, if you don't, if you've never come to that place, if you say, well, I've been in church a lot, some people need to be saved from church and from religion. All you need to do is you need to just fall upon the mercy and grace of God. And if you have questions about that, actually for the first time in 15 months, we're going to have somebody up front to pray with you and to talk with you. Rich and Laura Benelli are going to be up here. So if you need prayer today, if you want to know more about Jesus, you, you come up front. All right? Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for your death and resurrection for us. I thank you, Lord, that I have nothing to boast and I have no place to go but to Jesus. I have, I have nothing. But, Lord, I do have you. And if I have you, I have life. And if I have you, I have fullness. Father, forgive me for trying to find fullness in the things that are temporary. Help me to find fullness in the things that are of you and are permanent, Lord. Help me, Father, to fall upon you. Father, and, and, and again, if there be anybody here today, if there be anybody here today that has not done that, Lord, and I'm not talking about, well, they, well I believe in Jesus. Well, Satan believes in Jesus. He trembles. I'm not, I'm not talking about whether I've, I've, I've done religious things. Lord, I'm, I'm talking about whether they've never accepted you and fully dove in. They've, they've stopped relying on them. They've, stopped, they've given up on themselves, Father. If they've not done that, Father, would they do that today? Would you, by your spirit, just move in their lives and their hearts this morning?
Lord, it, it's a humbling place. It, it absolutely is. But Lord, it's the only place because it's the only thing, way that I can be before you. So Father, would we just give up on us, Father? And, and even for those who know you, Father, we still do that. We still think we know what brings fullness of life. Well, I know God wouldn't normally do this, but I, I want it. I think this will make me happy. Father, forgive us for that and help us to find our satisfaction and our fullness only in you. That your glory might be seen, that Jesus Christ might be lifted up, that, that, your, that you might be exalted. Father, we love you so much. Again, move in those hearts and those lives that they would come to know you as, as Savior. Father, and if they have, Lord, may we, may we walk in that grace every day. I love you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name.
Father God, if, if we didn't have your goodness, what would we have? We would have nothing. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the goodness of Jesus that died for us on the cross. Thank you for the goodness of your patience and your forbearance, which, which doesn't crush us at our first sin or even our last sin, Father. But you are the one who is just and the justifier of those who believe, of those who have faith in you. Father, may we stand firm in you. May we grab hold of you and never, ever of anything else. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So you might have thought I forgot a verse. I didn't since I was going to be up front. Paul ends the book of Galatians in verse 18 with this. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and why would we think that he would do it any other way, right? The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Let's, let's keep seeking him, right? Let's keep looking to him. Let's keep watching out for him. Like I said, uh, Rich and Laura out front, if you need prayer, uh, they do have masks with them. And, and if even if you don't have a mask, but you would prefer they have a mask, all you have to do is just kind of walk up and do this, and they'll put a mask on. They got no issue with that at all. If you wear a mask up, they will put a mask on, okay? If you need prayer, if you want to talk, especially about salvation, you come up. Otherwise, I, again, I want to invite you outside. We're going to just celebrate our dads, and we're going we're gonna to enjoy the rices, the whole family. Uh, not for the last time, hopefully, because they'll be back eventually, like Linda. And then they'll play, but uh, but for a while. So um, I love you guys. I hope you have a great day. You guys are dismissed. Take care.